Bonjour et bienvenue à tous et à toutes. Nous sommes heureux de vous accueillir à la dernière session de la série Boîte à outils en sciences humaines numériques de la session d'hiver. Good morning and welcome to the final session of the winter 2021 iteration of the Data 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 DH Toolbox series. I'm Jada Watson, coordinator of the Digital Humanities at the University of Ottawa, and I'm delighted to be hosting the session, uh, the series this session. Before we begin today, I'd like to start um, with an Indigenous land affirmation. <coughs> nous rendons hommage au peuple agonquin, gardien traditionnel de cette terre. Nous reconnaissons le lien sacré de l'ondat l'unissant à ce territoire qui demeure non cédé. Nous rendons également hommage à tous les peuples autochtones qui habitent Ottawa, qu'ils soient de la région ou d'ailleurs au Canada. Nous reconnaissons les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons aussi le courageux dirigeant d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional guardian knowledge keepers, both young and old. We honor their courageous leaders, past, present and future. Um, what a whirlwind our year has been through the Data 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 series. We've covered such a range of topics and are ending our year with a very special session on linked open data with our friends from the University of Guelph, Susan Brown and Kim Martin. Dr. Brown is a professor in the School of English and Theater Studies at Guelph University, where she holds a Canada Research Chair in Collaborative Digital Scholarship. Her research centers on an ongoing interdisciplinary collaborative research endeavor, the Orlando Project, which published its flagship literary historical text base online with Cambridge University Press in 2006. The Orlando Project continues to innovate the production of advanced tools for feminist literary research. And we're going to hear more about uh, more projects that they're working on, what that Dr. Brown is working on today. Also joining us is Dr. Kimberly Martin, Assistant Professor in History at Guelph University and one of the co-creators of the new Culture and Technology Studies major. Her PhD from the University of Western Ontario's Library and Information Studies Department focused on the role of serendipity in historians' information seeking in both physical and digital environments. This work is now being extended to look at the ways that linked data and the semantic web can provide both serendipitous environments for humanity scholars and expose the contextual information they need for their research. Together, they are two of the three co-leads of the Linked Infrastructure for Networked Cultural Scholarship Project known as LINX, and they're going to explore today basic concepts behind the semantic web and discuss, discuss the benefits of linked open data for humanity scholars. And just to note that the chat is open, so feel free to um, engage with us there or submit questions through the Q&A. Um, and I will try to keep on top of sharing links uh, throughout for anyone who joins us a little bit late. And so now I'm really delighted to turn the screen over to Susan and Kim. Thank you so much, Jada. It's really a pleasure to be here. It would be nice to be in person, but there we have it. We're lucky to have this way of interacting and the benefit of being able to pull in people that would not otherwise be able to come. So welcome everybody. And um, what we're gonna do is walk through um, a number of slides and shift between those and uh, live presentation and invite you to participate if you want in doing things in parallel to us. Before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining today from Guelph where Kim and I both work. Guelph occupies the ancestral and treaty lands of several Indigenous peoples, including the Atawandron people and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we recognize and honor the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors who have also uh, contributed to the care for the land in this area. And we're part of the area covered by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, which underscores the importance of uh, collaborative learning. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Kim to get us going. Thanks. Hello, everybody. So I am really excited to be here and talk to you uh, a little bit with Susan about linked data. Jump in here. This is what our outline for the day looks like. Um, we are going to let you know that linked data is everywhere, whether or not you think you've interacted with it, you probably have. Talk to a little bit about the basics of what, what it means to work with linked data. 
and about ontologies uh, before turning over to our own project, Lynx, and why uh, we think it's in an important um, advancement in the Canadian scholarly scene. And we'll leave you with some tools for exploring things a little bit further um, on your own if you, if you feel inspired. So linked open data is everywhere. We've interacted with it in different ways. Anyone um, who has built a Wikipedia page, for example, has had to fill out a little information box that you see here on the left-hand side. Um, and that information, the name or birthplace or um, occupation of the person that you were writing about, for example, um, gets put into a um, information box, um, info box like this one you see on Zadie Smith. And that information is then uh, pulled into a linked data system called DBpedia. Um, and that is used to power different places on the web. One of them that you'll see with, see likely daily in your life, the Google Knowledge Graph. And it powers things that we, we you know, use in our regular search behavior. Um, the, you might also be interested in pages, the books that like Zadie Smith, for example, has written, and also tells us personal information um, about, about the author herself. It also, in addition to different things on the web, um, powers different research projects. And for the purposes of today, we're going to use a really cool uh, project called Linked Jazz to walk you through the different elements of linked data. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me when I jump in and out of slides here. Um, I have put the link to Linked Jazz into the, um, into the chat if people want to jump in and follow along. And I'm going to hop over there quickly and um, show you where Linked Jazz pulls its data from. So I'm going to jump in to the network visualization tool. So Link Jazz is a research project that investigates the application of linked open data technologies to digital cultural heritage materials. Its goals are to uncover meaningful connections between documents and data related to both the personal and the professional lives of jazz artists, and to take those tools and make them more broadly applicable to anyone who wants to work with linked data. So it draws on jazz history materials and um, those in a digital format to expose relationships between musicians and reveal their community network, which we can see here in the form of this network graph. So in this network visualization tool, you can see if any artist that you happen to click on, you can see their immediate relationships in one degree. And you can also see their little information panel pop up. If you look in the bottom right corner of that panel, you'll see that the information is being pulled from Wikipedia. And you can click out to that link as well and go to their Wikipedia page. And if you hit the play button, you'll hear a little bit of music and it'll take you to a YouTube page where that music has all been um, uh, collected in a kind of larger library of, of jazz tunes. There are different ways of exploring this network. Um, we're looking right now at the fifth fixed network where um, people with the most links are on the outside. And if we click on the similar network, it takes just a second to render, and then it links people um, with the most connections in the side of the graph, and you can poke around and quickly see how many connections they have and how far it passes around, how far their connections go. I think the most interesting and easy to ascertain one of these is the gender network, where you can quickly see um, the women um, in red and the men in blue, and how uh, how the gender may may or may not have impacted the relationships between jazz singers, but that it was a largely gendered community when it started out. I'm gonna hop back to the slides and turn it over to Susan to talk about the basics. Sure, so I'm gonna talk about what's underneath here. Um, linked open data was um, conceptualized by Tim Berners-Lee, who created the, the web as we know it, and collaborators within the W3C consortium. And it um, is often articulated in terms of five uh, sort of increasingly um, more open and interoperable uh, types of data. So first of all, you can make your stuff available on the web, make it open. Um, if you make it structured, say in the form of a CSV file or a spreadsheet, then that's better than just putting it up as plain text without any structure in it. Um, make it 
into an, a non-proprietary format, so like a CSV instead of an Excel file, that's even better. Then using URIs to denote things, URI stands for Uniform uh, or Universal Resource Identifier, and basically it's a usually a web resolvable address that points to an entity of some kind, a thing. So it could be a document, it could be a person, it could be an organization, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into um, how linked open data works. And then if you link your data to other data in standardized ways, then um, you are at five star linked open data. So if you look at the um, image on the, on the bottom right, you can see it moving up in terms of its uh, linked and interoperable features as a result of adopting these strategies. So if we move on to thinking about um, URIs in a little more detail, these are some examples. They can denote London. So here we have GeoNames, which is a big uh, collection of structured place names um, and place uh, identifiers in terms of geolocations. Uh, a book identified through Wikidata, which we'll um, point to as one of the further resources that you might want to explore, an amazing um, collection of linked data crowdsourced like Wikipedia, but it's uh, linked data and people. Um, and VIAF is the Virtual International Authority file. So this is their uh, identifier for Zadie Smith. And if you click on any one of these, you will get to some information about that person. And then underneath, a machine will be able to read that information about the person. And that's really what makes linked data different from a lot of the web pages that you would encounter in your daily research or your daily life, um, is that it has that machine readable under layer. And uh, sometimes uh, the analogy is made to a credit card, right? You can read the number on the credit card by looking at those punch numerals on the front, but the machine reads it through the magnetic strip on the back. So uh, moving on then, um, how do you describe how resources work? Um, those pages that give you information about those entities through the URIs are structured using something called the resource description framework, which is basically a way a language or a grammar for representing data um, or resources as they're um, as they're called on the web and within rdf everything is represented in the form of what are called triples and they're triples because they have three parts and they're kind of like a grammatical structure with a subject a predicate which will be a relationship or a property of some kind that belongs to that person and an object. And ideally, all three of these things should have a URI, although you can get away without having them, um, particularly for objects, if, if uh, need be. So let's talk a little bit about what uh, technologies make linked data work. So we've talked about the resource description framework a little bit. That's how you structure statements about these entities, which you have in the form of URIs. The web ontology language, or OWL, is a way of formalizing, again, so that machines can read and interpret the data, the relationships between those entities, how different types of things interact. And Sparkle is a query language that is used to um, uh, ask questions and, and pull together uh, materials from across different websites using the structures of the ontology and the resource description framework. Um, uh, characteristics. So when we think about a, a triple, a straightforward triple, here's one about Zadie Smith. Um, she is the subject and although we're representing here in this sort of simplified version of, of XML RDF with the pointy brackets, um, she would really be represented by her VIAF identifier, not by her uh, name, which is really one of her properties. It's a label. So for instance, linked open data can have multiple labels for the same thing, which makes it very friendly to uh, multilingual resources, for instance, or to um, describing people who might have um, contested names, who might be referred by different names uh, from, from different communities. Then we have the predicate has literary style and the um, object, which is the, the literary style of comic fiction. So these little short statements in the form of triples can be uh, put together either on the same website or across multiple websites into collections of triples, which again are all very simple on their own, but uh, add up to more than uh, they would uh, 
represent on their own simply because they are linked to each other through these technologies. So here we have a small collection of triples um, about On Beauty by Zadie Smith, the fact that it alludes to E.M. Forster and uh, that Forster has political views. So when you take those little collections of triples or even much bigger collections of triples, if they're structured by an ontology, then that ontology tells you about how those things relate to each other. So often that's in terms of what types or classes do. So an illusion can be understood as a type of intertextuality, or it can be about relationships between different components of the data. So an author can have political beliefs and from that you can extrapolate that there's a relationship to the work that they create. So when you have those RDF structures that describe the data, and you put them in conversation with an ontology, then you can do a couple of different things. One is that you can inference, you can find out more than is explicitly stated in the data by drawing on the logical structures of the ontology to make sense of um, something that a human would be able to infer and that a computer with these structures can also infer. So we can say that Zadie Smith is intertextually related to E.M. Forster because we know that intertextuality is a sur property it includes illusion. Um, and we can ask queries like what texts relate to freedom of expression or what texts um, are novels or what texts are by Zadie Smith or Ian Forster, whatever. You can also represent these things not only as language, but as graphs. So at the bottom, the same statement could be represented in terms of the relationship between a node or a vertex in a graph and that would be both the subject and the object would take the form of nodes and the, the properties or relationships between them are the edges. So you can take this set of statements that we had in the previous slide and we can render it in the form of a graph. Um, so this kind of uh, visualization is probably familiar to many people from um, context that's become part of our sort of general literacy. And you can see those exact same relationships being reflected here. And you can see you know, additional inferences and queries that could be made on the basis of those. Why is graphing important in this context, the ability to represent linked open data as a graph? It's because graphs are really fast for computers to um, be able to traverse. Something like a hierarchical structure like XML is much more computationally um, uh, uh, intensive and it, it takes a lot more um, time to get stuff out of hierarchical structures than it does to get things out of graph structures. So it's one of the reasons why linked open data um, takes this form is so that machines can become our partners in making sense of all this data that we have on the web. So the linked open data graph, um, the, the, the idea of the semantic web was articulated around the, the turn of the century. By 10 years later, you had quite a lot of data on this graph. In the middle of this graph, you will probably not be able to read depending on the size of your screen, um, that the, the center of that graph is DBpedia. DBpedia is a linked open data representation of Wikipedia. And as you know, when you search Google, a lot of, you know, a lot of um, Wikipedia uh, hits will come up you know, towards the top of your results. That's because it's a very interlinked uh, website. And in the same way, DBpedia has formed the, the sort of core, the most linked site within the semantic web graph because it is so big and um, is linked to by so many other linked data resources. So that was the semantic web in 2010. By 2017, it got you know, quite a bit bigger. Wikipedia is still at the center there in sort of the taupe color. Um, and then by 2020, it got bigger again and you can sort of barely see, I think where, I'm not even sure where Wikidata, or sorry, DBpedia is in, in all of that, but it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, you can easily access these visualizations on the web, they're interactive. So you dig into them a bit more, but you'll see that um, there's uh, various domains in, signified by the color and the humanities does not come up in any of those. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that we're, um, so trying to articulate the value of linked open data for um, humanities scholars is that we're not really registering on the semantic web, which is being driven in large part by corporate interests and government interests at this point. 
So um, feel free, by the way, to pop questions into the chat as we're going. We're really happy to pause and um, discuss, especially as we're moving through these um, live demos. If there's anything that's not making sense or you have some interesting observations to make, uh, we are more than happy to pause and discuss. We're doing well in terms of time, so there'll be a chance to talk at the end. But uh, if you have anything that you'd like to discuss in context, please do not hesitate to just pop a question in. All right, so back to Link Jazz. Um, we want to look a little more closely here at how the RDF is doing. So let's take a look at Toshiko Akiyoshi, um, who's a really interesting figure to me because um, she kind of got pulled into the jazz scene uh, from a marginal position and then got really interlinked with a whole bunch of people. So you can see that she's, you know, she's quite connected in relation to some of the other people in this graph. And when we double click on her within the Link Jazz interface, we see her specific network. Um, as Kim said, we can, if we want to, you know, find out more about her, we can click on that play button and we'll hear her playing piano. Um, the image there, it has been pulled from Wikimedia. It's the image used in the Wikipedia entry about her and you'll see the little blurb about her is also from uh, Wikipedia and we can click through to the whole thing if we want to. So um, these are all resources from outside Link Jazz. Um, Link Jazz does, I think, host some uh, some data, like the transcripts of the recordings of the uh, interviews, perhaps. But mostly, what you're seeing in this interface is actually being pulled in from outside, and it gives us a, a context and and connection um, to those other materials on the web because it's structured as linked data. So Kim had the connection to Camp Basie there for a second ago. Um, let's just check out what those, um, dig into what those relationships are, are based on, which is the transcript link down at the bottom of that uh, pop-up box. So what this pulls up is the basis of Link Jazz is these oral um, histories, these interviews with the artists that have been um, uh, sourced from various archives. So if we click on transcript source, that would give us a, a link through to the Smithsonian Jazz Collection. Um, so we, you know, we have the provenance, we know where it came from, um, and then the names of the people who are connected to each other have been um, pulled out. So you can see Count Basie is, um, is, is flagged there, and I think you can maybe scroll down and see that there's a number of references to, to, to Count Basie in the, um, in the materials. And uh, so again, you know, this is wonderful, you know, interlinking of information and so on, and you can see the sources, so you have a much fuller sense of context. And then what I want to focus on is down at the bottom of the screen, the semantic data from the 52nd Street crowd. Uh, we're going to go to 52nd Street, not literally, but virtually um, in a moment. But um, look at the way these relationships are being characterized. Um, we have an influence relationship. She was influenced by Count Basie. She was a band member of Count Basie. She knows of him. She's an acquaintance of him. She's friends with him. She played together with him. She um, mentored him. So it was a two-way mentoring relationship. She also met him. I think we knew that by now. Obviously, these are not being ordered in any kind of sort of hierarchical way. Collaborated with him and was in a band with him. So we have you know, a kind of rich set of representations of um, what these lines, which don't tell you anything about what the relationship is, did they meet once or were they, you know, intimate partners or, or collaborators, we can't tell that from, from looking at the visualization, um, but the um, actual uh, links as they're being um, uh, laid out here, give us much more precise information about what those links are. So, um, Link Jazz has really pulled together all of this data and the, the work that's gone into the project, particularly in the 52nd Street uh, crowdsourcing project is about what those relationships are and, and how to link people in a much more precise way, which goes beyond what a lot of linked open data does, right? It's getting into the, you know, the, the, the substance of the of the documents. It's not linking things sort of on a document by document basis, but looking at actual links between people as they're embedded in natural language um, records of you know the history of jazz. 
Um, so the value comes from linking it all together and from being able to specify that link. Um, so it's providing the, the connections, the context, enrichment, but also there's a, a strong analytical element here, this critical element. How do you characterize those relationships and um, uh, what kind of sense do you make of them? So on the one hand, it seems like it's relatively basic to pull all these things together. The visualizations show us who's the most central person in the histories of jazz in the, you know, those uh, overviews of the, the, the big visualizations, the bigger the bubble, the more um, important the person is in terms of the number of links that they have to other people. That's called degree centrality in social network analysis. So hopefully you're getting a sense of how linked open data um, connects to the kinds of inquiry that we engage in in the humanities and that the kind of representation of it that you get within linked jazz is just one uh, possibility in terms of what you could do with this data. It's an interface that makes it much more accessible, but it's by no means the uh, limit of what you could do. Um, so if we want to dig into how those relationships that we were seeing called out there in um, the relationship uh, between those two musicians, we need to talk a little bit more about ontologies. So vocabularies we all know from things like Library of Congress subject headings, they're controlled terms that are used to um, classify uh, things, often resources, but often also characteristics of people. And they often come up in the context of metadata. And ontologies are really just a more formalized and structured version of a vocabulary. There's not even a very clear dividing line um, in, in many ways between what uh, vocabularies and ontologies are. So if you click through to, um, and we, we can give you the link to the slides at the end, it was on the first slide, but if you missed it, we'll, uh, we'll pop it into the chat. Um, if you click through to that W3C resource, um, it's talking about vocabularies and vocabularies is the title at the top of the page, but the, the name of the document is ontologies. They obviously flipped it at some point. So really a, a formal ontology is a kind of controlled vocabulary and it uses a special language designed to be interpreted by computers. So moving on, the kind of the, the language that is typically used in um, uh, linked open data context is OWL, as we saw in, in the slide about how RDF works. Uh, thank you for moving us. Did you go backwards or forwards, Kim? I went forwards. I think okay. we had a slide out of order, but that's okay. Right. Okay, no worries. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was just a bit disoriented uh, <laughs> in, in online context, so I apologize. Uh, so the web ontology language is really a, a grammar for representing the structure of relationships between things, between categories of things and their properties. It's based on first order logic, which means that machines are able to process it in particular ways. That same uh, uh, grounding in first order logic means that it's really limited in certain kinds of ways. There's certain things you can't do with it, which you might want to get into in discussion in a little bit. Um, so we have um, web ontology language governing ontologies. We have vocabularies, which we're all familiar with. Um, if we can go back to that slide, Kim, the one with the list of vocabularies, right? We all know Library of Congress subject headings, but there are other ones. The, the Getty Institute has uh, many really useful ones to do with, but also going well beyond um, art and architecture. Um, and there are in the in the linked data space, uh, geonames and, and wiki data, uh, which is, um, you know, generating a lot of, of uh, names of entities and properties and so on. These are all um, controlled vocabularies, but Wikidata has an ontology as well. Uh, Geonames has an ontology under it. So again, there's a kind of slide between vocabularies and ontologies. But typically when we're talking about ontologies, we're talking about those high level relationships between types of things and properties and you know how those things relate to each other. And when we're talking about vocabularies, we're usually talking about more specific things. Okay, um, so there are uh, lots and lots of ontologies out there. Um, for various kinds of things. There are um, a lot of quite generic ontologies. These are some of the ones that are used quite often in the um, library and, and um, humanities 
worlds, there are not that many that are really focused on the humanities per se. So PSYDOC CRM, which started with um, sort of archaeology and things to do with cultural heritage institution objects, is now expanding to deal with things like social relationships and so on. Um, and it's one of um, relatively few that are dealing with um, uh, humanities content, but that there are a few, and we'll see that as we look at what's under the hood as far as the Link Jazz um, project goes. So when we're talking about ontologies um, we, and vocabularies, we really are talking about um, what I'm going to call the three R's here. And it really boils down to reuse, 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 rather than re reuse, um, reduce, and recycle. But I've sort of articulated it here in terms of those ones. And I do think there's a, a pleasing kind of similarity between the RDF um, logo and, uh, and the recycling logo. So really it's about taking identifiers from other sources, ideally ones that have been used by lots of other sources, that is to say authoritative ones from things like VIAF or um, other organizations and using those to identify entities rather than coming up with new ones on your own. Vocabularies, if you're looking for terms for literary style, for instance, trying to reuse ones that are out there and um, not necessarily coin your own. This can come um, as a, uh, uh, this is probably one of the most difficult things I think for people in thinking about how linked data works in a humanities context because we're so used to being able to nuance our language in ways that are you know, very precise. And sometimes that can be in tension with vocabulary reuse. And again, ontologies, instead of coming up with your own unique way of seeing the world and representing that as an ontology, trying if possible to adopt another ontology or take from existing ontologies relationships that you need in order to represent your data. And what that does, reusing and reusing and reusing, is means that there's, um, a coherence and a conversion of uh, the representation of data on the web instead of lots of redundancy and ambiguity about, you know, are we talking about the same John Smith in these two contexts? John Smiths are very hard to disambiguate and linked open data gives us a way of doing that. Um, and uh, that means we can all share content much more easily and it becomes much more usable. So let's take a little look at what's um, behind the linked jazz ontology. If you look at the top, you can see that OWL defines what a thing is, um, the, the base OWL ontology. Um, and uh, then it's borrowing from a number of other ontologies. FOF is the friend of a friend ontology that was designed to describe websites and web content. Um, and they've taken quite a few names from FOF. There's the relations ontology, um, talking about you know, sort of more generic relationships. Then they've taken from the music ontology, which is another humanities oriented ontology, the term collaborated with, and they have coined their own terms, but you can see they've made them all subterms of that broader term so that um, a machine that may not be familiar with the link jazz terms would nevertheless potentially be aware of the music ontology and be able to make sense, if you like, to semantically interpret the content um, because it is linked to all these, it has reused all these other ontologies. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of what, uh, you know, the linked jazz strategy was. They didn't make up their own ontology, they're reusing things from Wikidata from all over the place, and even their ontology is uh, sourced very largely from existing, uh, existing ones. So now we're going to move into the 52nd Street space, which is the crowdsourcing of linked data relationships. And Kim's going to walk us through what's going on there. Yeah. So um, you may be asking um, as you're, uh, you know, playing around with, with Link Jazz, you know, how, who determines these relationships, all those relationships that Susan pointed out at the, at the bottom of the um, kind of pop up that opens when you click between two people. Um, really need someone to say this is the relationship right so what link jazz has done is actually created this um like crowdsourcing tool that crowdsources um and allows people to dive into the oral histories on which those relationships is uh is based um there is a uh tutorial 
that I can't see the button for the you tutorial. Go, right now. You have to go into a person and then it loads the on the tutorial for that person, which is right. quite easy. You sort of get the tutorial in context. There we go. Right. Yes. So that you can do the tutorial here if you wish that walks you through kind of step by step of how to do this. Um, maybe I'll go through it quickly because it doesn't take very long. Um, but uh, basically, it tells us that we are going to be able to use these kind of uh, relationships on the side that are the same ones that Susan indicated um, the two uh, the two people we talked about were how they were related. They could be an acquaintance or they could have collaborated with them, et cetera. Um, and then all the people that are um, mentioned in the interview that we that we have uh, clicked on. Um, uh, sorry, with Annie Ross are listed here. So we can see that their names are somewhere in the transcript, which is going to come up in this main page. Um, and what we're going to do, um, or anyone who uses this tool is going to do, is read these snippets of text or read the full text if they wish and try to determine how those relationships between two people are best defined, right? Um, I think the interface here is pretty neat because you don't have to just look at the one little snippet of text. You can go up and down and find more context. If you happen to, you kind of get thrown into these where the last person tagged, right? So if you want to go back up or back down or move down and try to figure out um, what is being said in a little more context, it's there. And then these are the buttons, as I mentioned, that allow you to say, um, yes, this is how I think this relationship is best, uh, best defined. And then you can go back to the start page if you want to. So let's see here an example of what might come up. So we have this huge bit of text. And just for, uh, for our own context, this is Annie Ross and this is the interviewer. And most of the text in all of these is from the person being interviewed because they're demonstrating all of their kind of um, relationships and talking about their um, different uh, experiences in the jazz world. So we'll see Oscar Brown come up here. Oops, clicked on him again. And then you can read a little bit about, um, about this. Um, we see that uh, she's describing them. He, she did another show, didn't even get to London. We opened in Oxford, it was not great. Oscar Brown Jr. was in it. Oscar Brown and I sang a couple of songs, right? And so you can see um, that many of these would be an option, right? They sang songs, she definitely met him, she knows of him. Um, we can't really tell for that whether or not they were acquaintances or close friends, um, but we could say that they, they played together, right? Um, and click that as an option. And then once you've selected that, it moves on to the next person's name and you just continue down the pipeline here. So you can see um, that it's kind of a nice, small set of options to choose from. Um, but I just did this um, in a class and they were quite frustrated with these. They wanted to go beyond the options of, of what Link Jazz had kind of provided. And some felt that they couldn't answer these at all, in which case they have said you could skip. If you do feel there should be something else or there's something you're not sure about, you can add a comment to these, right? So you can say, um, you know, I'm, you know, I think this, this one should be uh, a little bit different or, um, or you could, I suppose, suggest adding another relationship, although I think they've kept it quite small intentionally to be able to organize what, uh, what goes back here. So those, um, once you've um, submitted them, build the network, right? They build those relationships out. And you can see if we go back to, sorry, if we go back to the list here, that um, they're kind of all in progress, the ones that are left. And some of them are at the bottom have been finished. And um, I don't know this, but I assume they're waiting um, kind of for someone to go through and approve them and answer the questions that people might've put in, et cetera, before kind of launching these live. So you are in turn helping grow their relationship. So I'm gonna pop back into slides here. Right, so I think through all of this, I hope we've demonstrated um, that humanity scholars um, have things to contribute to the web, whether it's through a uh, you know kind of directed project like um, like Link Jazz, or if it's through a bigger uh, project that you're going to hear about shortly, where we connect all types of humanities research. Um, what does linking to the web do for our own for our own research for our own data sets? Well, it makes it easy to discover data. 
um, if once things are linked, um, much like popping around in a Wikipedia article, you know how easy it is to get from one thing to another. It helps to surface information and data that might not have already um, either been online or been easily findable. It helps us build on what already exists. So instead of creating, you know, the 8,000, maybe 8 millionth page on, um, say, William Shakespeare, we can all point to the same William Shakespeare, say things about him, but not necessarily have to recreate that work. Um, it allows us to add links. Um, and uh, below this, we have a link out to Wikipedia, or sorry, Wikidata. And you'll see um, if you click on a Wikidata page for anything you're familiar with, the um, uh, kind of links that are constantly added to tell more and more information about those individuals or other types of entities, places, or things. Um, and when we add all those links and we tell, you know, so many people tell information about a certain topic, they're going to come together in ways that we couldn't necessarily foresee, right? We're going to have those kind of aha moments when two big data sets come together and tell the, you know, maybe slightly different stories about the same individual. And that's where our research questions kind of pop out. And finally, those inferences that Susan was demonstrating um, in the first kind of couple slides about how uh, how RDF and, and OWL work um, allow us to make the web smarter because we can start to ask questions and get computers to infer things based on what and how we've set up our ontologies and our data sets. So uh, why humanity scholars? Why us? Um, we know how to think crit critically about information. Um, and we know that there's questions that we have that we uh, you know, can't necessarily answer with what we have at the moment. So we can push a little further. We can ask queries of bigger data sets, of data sets jumping together. But at the same time, we can sit back and um, really carefully think about how we constructed those things, right? How, um, how ontologies are constructed, where problems might lie, where we might have to think critically about those relationships. We want to make sure that the cultural record, all of our museum data, library data, doesn't solely belong to corporate entities. Um, the huge linked data sets that are out there right now, uh, many of them belong to our friends and social media corporations, right? And that's not where we want the history of uh, humanity to lie on the web. We want to be able to connect digital humanities or other projects um, with others going on in the world. Um, so uh, links uh, that you'll learn about in a minute does a really great job of connecting groups in Canada. Um, but just by using linked data and thinking about what other people are doing and what we're aware of, we're reaching out to projects that are existing um, all over the place. And finally, um, through kind of using, uh, using linked data and thinking through the language that the, we use, the questions we ask, and the ontologies we choose, we start to understand each other. It doesn't mean we have to agree on things, but it means we can understand and put together different people's points of view. Go ahead, Susan, talk about links. <laughs> so you might be asking yourself, if linked open data is so great, why isn't everybody using it for their research? There's all this data out there, it's driving Google searches, it's clearly useful in all sorts of ways. You click like on a Facebook page, you're essentially creating a link, but it's all behind you know, this, the, the Facebook um, uh, screen. Why are we not doing more of this? Well, it's because although we've given you a, a sort of sense of how linked open data works at a high level, you probably already have a sense that it's a fairly heavy technology stack behind a site like link jazz is a ton of work to make that work accessible and usable to allow people to create link data through an interface like 52nd street is uh, a lot of work not every project is going to have the resources to do that and there's not a lot of uh, really usable generalized infrastructure out there to help people uh, get going with linked open data for for their research so the linked infrastructure for networked cultural scholarship is a project that is aiming to do that it's going to convert enhance mobilize link and make accessible existing data sets from canadian researchers in working in the area of cultural heritage and take that uh, very diverse and heterogeneous body of data and make it available as linked open data interlink it and um, allow us to really evaluate in ways that we have not been able to do the potential of linked open data for research in the humanities. We've seen that potential for a long time. There's a lot of projects like Link Jazz that have, you know, pushed it to a certain limit, but really trying to bring that, um, you know, large sets of data from quite different areas and with different um, epistemological and intellectual frameworks and see, can we manage the kinds of conversations? Can we manage the kinds of inquiry that we need to do in order to be able to conduct humanities research? Can we manage the kinds of nuance that, that we require 
in the data that we have and the, and the, the groundedness, the specificity and situatedness of humanities knowledge. Can we actually do that in a linked open data framework? That is what LINX is uh, setting out to do. So it's a cyber infrastructure project founded by, uh, funded by the CFI. We're one year into it. It's a three-year project, and the expectation is that the infrastructure will be maintained after that. But we're one year into development and making good progress despite the pandemic, for which I'm very grateful to a really talented team of people who, who've come together under difficult circumstances to start building it. We have quite a lot of researchers already involved, as you can see, multiple universities and um, a number that aren't formal partners who are involved in, in other ways um, and external partners uh, beyond the university system in the uh, sort of memory institution and, and information ecosystem. Uh, and we're making new partnerships as, as we go because, you know, uh, everybody is thinking much more about linked open data, even than a few years ago when we uh, started pulling this project together. So we're building out into a bigger network uh, as we go. So what is LINX going to do exactly? Well, it's going to take um, source data sets from a number of different areas. So researcher data sets are at the core, but we're also looking at how can we make it easy for people to take data that's already online in places like the Internet Archive or the Hathi Trust collections and uh, create linked open data that they can then use in their in their own research. How can we use the amazing resources that Library and Archives Canada and Canadiana have and uh, put those um, to, to use using linked open data in new ways and make them more accessible to, to researchers. So we're taking those data sets and we're converting them into linked open data. We're developing, uh, building on existing tools and, and developing some tools ourselves where there are gaps to uh, take data, whether it's structured data, so you know your spreadsheets or your databases, semi-structured data like XML, including the text encoding initiative, um, and unstructured data, natural language. <clears throat> Converting that into linked open data or extracting linked open data from it, um, and then providing tools that can be used to clean it up in various ways and do a lot of the processing that is, um, you know, behind the scenes in a in a site like Link Jazz. So they've gone through already and identified all the named entities, for instance. The machine needs to be trained to do that. So we're we're working on those sorts of things and tools for validating it because machines don't necessarily understand whether a reference to London is going to be London, Ontario, or London, England. Uh, York University, <laughs> there are two. Um, so it, that uh, disambiguation needs to needs to happen in order to make the data useful for research um, purposes. And um, then once we've and we'll make those tools available for researchers to be able to process their data with their you know with their expertise. Kim, can you go back a slide? Yeah, thanks. Um, then, of course, we need somewhere to put linked open data. Uh, managing a linked open database, um, which is often called a triple store, is um, pretty heavy lifting as far as, as technology stacks go. You're not likely to do it on your, uh, on your home computer. Uh, so we're setting up a great big uh, storage facility for it, which will have an interface that allows people to interact with it in user-friendly ways and build on it. Um, and we're providing access in, in two ways, both through the, um, the platform and its interface and a number of other tools that will complement the, the platform that we're using, which is called Research Space. It was developed by the British Museum um, and we'll be um, pushing it out uh, later this year for people to take a look at. Um, it's available, if you want to Google it, it's available to look at um, in, in um, a demo version now put out by the British Museum. Um, and also we'll be giving access to the conversion tools that we have developed so that people could continue to create linked data beyond the, the data sets that we have resources to convert ourselves and um, hopefully build up a kind of virtuous circle whereby uh, you know, people create linked data and then the tools are available to allow it to be refined and enhanced and expanded and so on. And that um, body of linked open data that we will be establishing will continue to grow and be corrected and, and improved and uh, uh, you know, become part of the everyday life of researchers in a, in a range of ways. Uh, that complement and, and expand the, the tools that we have available to us in our work now. 
So um, you can learn more about links through our website if you're interested. We're happy to talk to you if you want to know more. We'll be doing, um, you know, continue. We, we push out news in the form of a newsletter on a regular basis, and we'll be doing more and more um, talks, presentations, workshops, and so on as there's more to, um, to tell you about. So that's links. And we have also just put together a number of um, slides that just point to ways that you can explore linked open data on your own using pretty usable uh, tools right now. So those are um, Wikidata, as we've mentioned, is a big contributed data um, set, just like Wikipedia is a, is a crowdsourced encyclopedia. And the query service allows for nice exploration of, of the Sparkle query language. It gives you examples that you can then slot in other things. So there's one example that allows you to search for rock musicians. You can just change that to jazz and you know play around. Um, and the Reasonator gives you a view of entities that are not um, that are, that's prettier, nice, more nicely formatted than the one you get out of the box with Wikidata. Um, Huvis is a tool that Lynx is developing further to work with uh, with the Lynx data, and um, you can explore it now. It's going to be um, getting some nice improvements to the interface in the next very short while and some user testing over the summer. So if you're interested in participating in that, please let us know. And um, comes after that. Oh, yes, Europeana. So Europeana is the big cultural heritage um, a site that pulls together resources from cultural memory institutions across Europe. They've got a linked open data uh, project, which you can explore. There's um, Humanum, uh, which is short for Humanité Numérique, a really impressive infrastructure for linked data out of France that has two tools, Nicala and Isidore, with both French and English interfaces that allow you to get a sense of how uh, research mobilization can work through uh, linked open data. And um, finally, there's a bunch of workshops coming up, um, including one through DH site and the University of Ottawa. So look out for announcements of those, a couple of introductions to linked open data, and then Kim and I are doing one on ontologies uh, later in the summer. So we have finished for once in our lives well in advance of the end of a session. Um, I think we should open it up to discussion if we can and um, invite people to pop in questions, comments, and uh, what do you think? I don't know how much of this was new or a review for people. Um, this, every time, I, my mind is blown. <laughs> every time. I, um, I, I'm a big fan of, of Connie's website for, um, for the DH lab, or not, sorry, not for the DH lab. What am I thinking? The LCGC. Did I get the acronym right? Anyways. Um, I yes. Will. I will look it up and give you the link to it. Thank you. And I'd never seen linked jazz. And the whole time I was like, oh, gosh, this is how this is how I envision song data mm -hmm. one day. But with country music. <laughs> and it's possible, right? They've made it so you can yeah. grab the yeah, grab, grab their their code and be able to rework it. I'm thinking of trying to test it out with oral histories. So yeah. Um, yeah, being able to see those transcripts and and what comes out of them, what relationships come up that I just wouldn't have imagined, um, you know, out of oral histories that I've conducted with class or in future classes. Yeah, there's so much potential here. We don't, we don't have any questions yet in the chat or the Q and A, but um, would you mind um, sharing a little bit about who's who's part of the Lynx team? Because you're a big team across the country. Yes, we are. Um, well, we could start with University of Ottawa, where uh, yeah. Connie Carlton, who's on the call right now, is um, leading us in terms of how we think about uh, TEI, text encoding initiative um, materials, and how those can best be represented as linked open data. Like, what's the where's the sweet spot between the kind of hierarchical linear structures of TEI that are, you know, so well represented in XML and the kinds of networks that are embedded in those documents that you don't get it so easily through the hierarchical structures. 
So that's um, U of O, and I think U of O is also leading our translation efforts um, because we are committed, our, our site, I'm sorry to say, is not bilingual. That wasn't by design, that was by misfortune. Um, but uh, the, 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 the final links interface will be bilingual and um, U of Ottawa is playing a major role in that. Um, we have partners at U of T through the Scholars Portal, uh, which is a major infrastructure for um, sharing digital tools and content across Ontario universities and is starting to play a big role in um, sort of infrastructure more broadly in Canada. So that's a really valuable partnership. Um, the, um, let's see, moving at, at Guelph, Guelph is our, our, our core team where we have um, a, a project manager who keeps our communications going and everything running and is, you know, um, doing a lot of work around um, uh, the student supervision and training and, and things like that. And that's Sarah Roger. We have um, Peter Botha, who's the technical um, manager. Deb Stacy, who's our technical lead, along with myself and Kim sort of leading the project. Um, we have a data interface developer named Liam Mo, and we have um, Aaron Canning, who is our ontologist uh, at all at Guelph. Then we have partners in Alberta, um, Natalie Hervieu and uh, Danielson Barbosa are working on natural language processing. And basically how much can we automate the low hanging fruit, like identifying a name, identifying a place, and even automate low hanging relationships, like where someone was born or when they were born, things like that, that computers are pretty good at being able to pull out so that, so that we as researchers can focus on the, the thorny question of, you know, was this a collaboration? Was this influence? What, you know, what exactly is the more nuanced relationship about? Um, so uh, that's, um, Alberta and then UVic is involved, uh, the, um, the focusing on the um, platform itself and the, the storage, um, uh, triple store and, and the research space platform. Um, McGill is involved in, uh, many of you may know Voyant tools already, so we're looking at how can Voyant tools interact well with links data and with the source data sets that are um, uh, you know, connected to the link data. Have I left anybody out, Kim? I'm trying to think. I, I shared the links project team page because I'm like, there's too many people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so the research people. the research theme leads are the yeah. other the other folks that are spread across. Um, Stacy yeah, Allison right. Casson. Yeah, so York is Stacy Allison Casson leading a research theme. Sharon um, Farnell is also involved, although not form uh, not um, quite so formally. So you know, we've got heavy hitters in terms of the library community. Lisa Goddard out at UVic is leading the, the efforts out there. Um, and uh, John Bath at University of Saskatchewan, Janelle Genstad at University of Victoria, um, all involved. Like it's a big group as, as yeah. Kim says. And there's lots of, lots of researchers who are, you know, really helping us to grapple now that we're starting to ingest data sets, really helping us to grapple with the thorny question of like, how do you really do this in practice? What kind of support do researchers need? How can we try and provide that in a way that once we don't have the full team complement, once the initial funding runs out, we can make it sustainable so that people can keep doing it. And that's a, a challenge. Um, and across a lot of very different disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, yeah. I imagine you must be working a little bit with the folks at McGill who work on uh, music encoding, which is a whole yeah. whole other <laughs> area. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you have a question from Connie now. Yeah. Um, she'd love to hear more about teaching using linked open data in the classroom and then adds, as we work in training the next generation of historians, literary scholars, teachers, policy folks, etc. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about what I do in my classroom, Connie. Um, I teach uh, at the moment, I teach the fourth year um, kind of digital history courses. Um, and they end up being wider digital humanities because until the fall, we didn't have official digital humanities or our new cultural and technology studies major. Um, and I usually, uh, these students always have a big final project and they're always, you know, thinking about that. I get them thinking about that final project from the kind of first week. Um, and the last couple of times I've taught the course, I've had students whose projects are just screaming for linked data. And I always encourage them to read ahead, right? Cause I don't usually do it until kind of the last couple of weeks. Cause I like to teach them networks ahead of time. And I like to teach them archives ahead of time. Um, 
And so two, two times ago that I taught, I had this student that pitched this project for this um, you know, way of networking old video game magazines, right? He wanted to bring together all these different points and the different games and the creators, et cetera. Um, and literally in the middle of a discussion um, uh, about linked data, he, you saw this like light bulb, like, oh, this could do it, right? And this semester it's happened with a student who wants to bring um, various sources together over World War II. Right. So um, and what we do with this, well, what we did this semester walking through Link Jazz um, was I had them, uh, you know, walk through with us and um, Susan and I did. Where did we do our our handout? That was for Paul's class. Right. We taught yeah. um, we taught another DH course and just kind of introduced them to Link Jazz step by step. And we had uh, more of a handout than what we did today that kind of pushed them to think about the questions of the things we pointed out to you. Um, and I did that with with my class as well. And then I had them think about what else could you connect, right? It doesn't have to be jazz. And when they realize all of a sudden that it doesn't have to be jazz, they did what Jada just did, right? Oh, country music. And then jump to, ooh, I don't know, dinosaurs, like whatever they, whatever they want to put together. And then you throw them into looking for sources, right? Like, so go and find those museum sources. See if they, if they are using RDF. Can you find out what format their data is in, et cetera? So it's a matter of getting them excited about it um, uh, and really, you know, I guess it's the way I teach in general, but finding their own path to to thinking about what like data could do. Um, and now that we have this this new major coming up, we you know by the time we get students that have been thinking about this in first year and second year, by the time they get to fourth year and having kind of the links project, um, you know, being able to develop these tools and we can you know we'll have further instructions on how to teach with them. I think that we'll see some fourth year projects come out that you know end in like true link data, either little data sets or thinking through an ontology and how it works, and that's going to be really exciting. Yeah, with the whole class dedicated to it. Yeah, that would that would be the dream, <laughs> but, but we'll definitely have yeah final projects that I think will work with us on links. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think if we can get to the point where we have better infrastructure, it will all become a lot easier. It's it's not something you can invite an undergraduate student to sort of wholeheartedly embrace for a, a project. But we found with uh, summer students, for instance, that um, some of the interfaces a bit like link jazz but actually even more slightly gamified you could see how the progress bar in 52nd street worked oh i've done seven percent i'm so happy um but uh wikidata has some has something called mix and match which is a tool that basically allows you to dive into any data set that's being processed and decide whether the matches that the system is not sure about are actually matches and you can, you know, it registers your contributions and tracks your work against other people's work and so on. And it's a really nicely designed, fun tool. So I think that um, one of the things that we'll be trying to think through in Lynx is how can we provide those sorts of interfaces or at least create an infrastructure that gives the, um, the, the basis for um, the creation of those sorts of interfaces. We have to rein ourselves in. We don't have that much time and we have a lot to do. So we have to be uh, modest in our ambitions around interface. But I think that uh, being able to, you know, let students contribute to and see their contributions to bigger projects is, is one sort of very easy foot in the door, get everybody involved, get everybody thinking about, you know, what is a match anyway? Is this really the same person? How do you decide that? It, it gets them into research really fast. Um, and just like the 52nd Street tagging gets you into the whole question of like, does this ontology actually match the relationships that I'm seeing here? Or are there gaps? Or how would I frame this differently? Um, and that I think really helps people understand the relationship, which I think we're always trying to get at in, in teaching um, technology within the humanities, which is the relationship between the underlying data structures and the, the interface and how is, how, is that, uh, how is that working? Yeah, I wanna be in your classrooms, is that okay? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we're not in our classrooms now. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Um, well, I don't see any new questions coming in, so I'm tempted to say, why don't we end early and enjoy some sunshine before we go back into a Zoom classroom? Um, but we do have um, a linked open data um, workshop that's part of DH site this summer. Um, and it's going to be 18 hours over a two week period. And we will be announcing the instructors uh, within the next week and a half. 
So look forward to that announcement. As we do everything, it will be on Twitter. Um, so, so keep your eyes on our Twitter feed uh, for more information. Um, oh, slide link. Let me just get that right away. There's, there was just a request for it in the uh, Q and A. Oh, thread. Great, and um, I'll be sure when this goes up um, on YouTube to share a link to it because I know there were some people who were not able to join us today. Um, thank you both for ending the year uh, with us. I'm really honored that you said yes to the invitation and that uh, you had time to be with us today. Um, and I just look forward to learning more from you both um, on this topic. Great. Thanks, Jada. It was a lot of fun. It was great to cement our ideas and move them forward. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Did you get it, Susan? Yeah, I put it in. It's in the q and I don't know whether people are seeing the q and one. I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well because it's easy. There was also a question about how to get the Lynx newsletter. If you just go to the linksproject.ca website, um, there's a newsletter um, menu item. And if you click on that, there's a, a link, I think, to subscribe to the newsletter. So yeah, they're really good. Um, we really, I, I say this because I don't have that much to do with them. Um, Sarah puts together an amazing sort of array of materials every couple months. They won't swamp your inbox, um, but they allow you to, um, you know, uh, keep up with what we're doing and see we list, you know, related events and um, jobs even when they come by our, you know, inboxes and, and yeah. Uh, and the links to the old ones are there. The, like it's like a library of all the old ones. So if you want to yep. look back and see what we've done, it's kind of kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. And we just passed our first anniversary, so we did a kind of summary of what we've done so far in the last one. Thanks, Francois. Thanks, Francois. <laughs> I love that. Happy sourcing, linking, validating, storing, and pushing out. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. That's a really great one to end the year on. <laughs> As we go into summer, happy sourcing, linking, validating, storing, and pushing out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much again. Um, thank you everyone who has joined us all year. Um, it's been it's been a really wild ride, and we will be back in person next year, hopefully, and maybe try to do some kind of, I don't know, online versus and in person scenario. So thank you for joining us and thank you, Susan and Kim, for leading today's discussion. No worries. Take care. Bye. Bye.